Ladies and gentlemen, this is TVP World. I'm your host, Benjamin Lee, and oh, welcome aboard the Eastern Express. In this episode, we're diving into a topic that sounds like it was pulled straight from a geopolitical soap opera, except with more sanctions and fewer love triangles. It's about Russia, South Ossetia, and Georgia, a trio that's been entangled in a complicated relationship since before a complicated relationship was a Facebook status option. Now, Moscow has signaled that it might only consider absorbing South Ossetia if Georgia gets too cozy with NATO, the typical playbook of Russia's foreign policy since Putin took power. But is that realistic? And if so, should we expect turmoil to appear in the Caucasus as well? Let's take a look at a report to find out more. In a move that could further alter the geopolitical landscape of the Caucasus region, South Ossetia, a self-proclaimed independent state that seceded from Georgia, is actively discussing the possibility of joining the Russian Federation. The region declared independence following a conflict between 1991 and 92 and received recognition from Russia after a brief war in 2008, which saw Russian forces intervene against Georgian attempts to reclaim the territory. Since then, only a handful of countries have acknowledged South Ossetia's sovereignty. However, the West has criticized Russia's actions, accusing it of effectively annexing the territory which constitutes one-fifth of Georgia's landmass. The Georgian government remains adamant about reintegrating both South Ossetia and Abkhazia into its national territory. Now the leadership of Ossetia says that any decisions regarding a potential referendum on joining Russia would be made in close coordination with the Russian government, considering existing bilateral relations and agreements. Last year, South Ossetia's Russian-backed leader, Alan Gagloyev, expressed aspirations for the region's formal incorporation into Russia. The majority of South Ossetians are ethnically distinct from Georgians, speaking a language akin to Farsi, and have largely adopted Russian passports. The local economy is heavily reliant on Russia, using the Russian ruble as its currency. The discussions between South Ossetia and Russia mark a significant moment that could lead to a referendum, potentially changing the status of the region and its international relations. And now, let's take a look at the issue in greater detail. Let's break it down. South Ossetia is a region that most of the world recognizes as part of Georgia, but it's had a bit of a cozy relationship with Russia since the early 90s. Fast forward to today, and Moscow's willingness to officially bring South Ossetia into its fold is being waved around like a geopolitical carrot, or perhaps in this case a geopolitical stick, aimed at deterring Georgia from joining NATO. Now, why does this matter? In the grand tradition of making decisions that seemed designed to appear in the history textbook under the heading, what were they thinking? Moscow's strategy here seemed to be as much about sending a message as it is about strategic interests. It's no secret that Russia views NATO expansion with about as much enthusiasm as a cat views a bath. The idea of Georgia, a country that shares a significant border with Russia, cozying up to NATO is about as welcome in Moscow as a screen door on a submarine. And so, Russia's message is clear. Get too close to NATO and we'll officially absorb a region that most of the world agrees is yours, but we've been awkwardly squatting on for over two decades. But let's not forget about Georgia and all this. Georgia has been looking westward with puppy dog eyes for a while now, hoping to join the NATO club and secure a bit of protection against its overwhelmingly large neighbor to the north. You know, much like wanting to join a neighborhood watch program because the guy living in the mansion at the end of the street keeps eyeing your yard. And recently, the Georgian government decided to stir the pot by appointing a new pro-Kremlin special rep for their prime minister, someone who's basically the go-between with Russia. Now, with a parliamentary election taking place in a little over half a year, Kremlin cheerleaders are already doing their best to pump up the volume on false promises, all to make sure their favorite Georgian party stays in the spotlight. In recent times, the ruling elite of Georgia have been actively using informal channels to connect the Kremlin to solve trade, economic, and political issues. For instance, these channels were used to prepare for the restoration of air traffic between the two countries last year. So what we have here is a geopolitical standoff, with South Ossetia as the chess piece that nobody can agree on. Russia is using it to keep Georgia from getting too close to NATO, while Georgia is trying to maintain its territorial integrity and move closer to the West. And as for South Ossetia, well, South Ossetia just wanted to stay on the board. 
And now here to shed more light on the issue is Sergei Somlini, director of the European Resilience Initiative Center. Hello, sir, and welcome to Eastern Express. Hello, and thank you for having invited me today. All right, so my first question would be how likely is it that Russia actually absorbs South Ossetia, or do you think it's another attempt at dangling it to kind of affect the election that's going on in Georgia? Well, um, there are like two levels of this uh, question. Uh, the first um, is South Ossetia, or what they call South Ossetia, is it already integrated de facto uh, into Russia, and uh, Russia is effectively has effectively control over what is happening there of course it's not what the russians would officially say but the russian um like the russian militaries are there the russian secret service is there secret police like the um the so-called authorities of uh, so-called south ossetia they cannot of course do anything without asking a permission from moscow and 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 but for Moscow, um, as we see since the uh, since the last years, it is important to demonstrate regularly that their uh, territory, what they claim to be their territory, expands, and that is what they did. For example, recently uh, with the so-called uh, DNR LNR, uh, Russia occupied territories in the eastern part of Ukraine when Putin has proclaimed them to be Russian regions before a full-scale attack of Ukraine. Then they did the same with the regions of Zaporizhia, Kherson uh, in, uh, in uh, Ukraine. And, uh, of course, they can do the same with uh, South Ossetia. That uh, is within the logic of the Russian dominance. They first uh, effectively occupy a territory, consume it, digest it, and after that, uh, when they need to boost their popularity and demonstrate that they can escalate further, they officially annex it. That costs them nothing, but they create them additional leverage also on the international uh, international level. Right. And speaking about the international level, I was also wondering how the West would react if Russia indeed takes such a step. Well, there are a lot of jokes about how deeply concerned is the West and uh, the international institutions like the United Nations, etc. Um, let us put it that way. Um, can it lead to effective steps? And if, what kind of? Um, would it mean like more sanctions? Most probably no. Like Russia's bombardments of Ukraine or um, kidnapping of Ukrainian children didn't lead to sanctions. Why South Ossetia? Will it lead to uh, some sort of uh, military support for uh, Georgia? I don't believe so, because if uh, Russia would just officially annex uh, South Ossetia, but will say, OK, but we will not go further, we will not try to attack Tbilisi and push our troops uh, further southwards, uh, then the West will say, OK, nothing has changed effectively. The Russians said uh, used to be like uh, full control over South Ossetia. So we don't want to provoke. And whom do we want to give uh, weapons like the pro-Russian partly government of Georgia? No, we don't want. So um, other steps condemnate like like uh, the West will condemn it. The, the West will maybe a call, uh, like, uh, summon Russian ambassadors, but I don't believe there will be anything beyond typical expressions of uh, we are not happy, which Russia normally ignores. Right, so it does sound pretty bleak. And at this point, would you categorize a, a South Ossetia as a foregone conclusion then in that case, or do you think there's any other ways to kind of keep it away from the hands of the Russians? Well, um, we have uh, lost the chance in 2008 and further uh, during the uh, presidency of uh, Mikhail Saakashvili, who was um, like pretty um, ready to uh, to restore a territorial sovereignty of his country. Um, and I don't think that now with the uh, proven weak West, and that's the problem, we, we are not weak uh, from the from the objective point of view, we have enough arms, we have enough economy, we are much stronger than Russia. But politically, our governments are either paralyzed, like in the US, or acting um, very slow, like uh, chancellorship of uh, Olaf Scholz, 
and other countries like Czechia or the Baltic countries, um, which are pretty active on uh, the, the field of support of Ukraine, they don't have enough leverage. And that's a problem. So as long as we cannot, cannot uh, support Ukraine uh, on a visibly, uh, visibly active war, a terrible war, I cannot say that we will be able to intervene in another conflict, which is much further from us, which many in Europe would see as a very local conflict without global consequence, and which many in Europe sees as a conflict which uh, has already taken place, and now we just like deal with the consequences of a frozen conflict, which is effectively frozen, they say. And here the um, perspectives are not that bright, I'm afraid. Right. And as we're talking about the same region, I'm also curious about Georgia and their uh, aspiration to be part of NATO, because the way I see it, there are uh, significant, well, not very significant, but not insignificant part of land that is still kind of being occupied by the Russians. So how does that fare into their chances of being a part of NATO? Well, in both cases of Georgia and Ukraine, we have very similar perspectives. Uh, we have um, Chancellor Angela Merkel back in her time um, practically rejected uh, their perspective of uh, joining NATO alliance. It was in the Bucharest summit. And um, after that, it was the stalemate practically. The, the, the both countries had similar problems, especially after Russia annexed uh, Crimea and uh, occupied parts of Donetsk and Luhansk region and in Georgia. Uh, Russia occupies uh, Abkhazia and South Ossetia. Uh, so that is a very uh, comfortable explanation for many politicians why both countries cannot join NATO, because they have territorial problems, unsolved problems. They have part of their sovereign territory being occupied. Um, at the same time, I need to say that my country, Germany, uh, joined NATO uh, while being partly occupied by by the Soviets, the Eastern Germany GDR, and while being in a legal state of war uh, with the Soviet Union. As the 1940, uh, 1954, um, the decision has been taken that next year the Federal Republic of Germany joins NATO. Uh, Germany didn't uh, stop the state of war with the Soviet Union officially. It was only ceasefire. It only next year, 1955. Uh, both countries signed a treaty which stopped the the, the, the the state of war, but it was not a peace treaty. Peace treaty was signed effectively in 1990. So we have the examples when um, state of war or occupation of territory was not a problem, but uh, obviously it doesn't apply for countries like Ukraine and Georgia, unfortunately. All right, you mentioned something kind of interesting for me here. You said that it's a comfortable explanation for the politicians to kind of bar Georgia and Ukraine from joining NATO. So my question would be, would that be your personal assessment that a more decisive action when it comes to having Ukraine being a part of NATO or even to some extent Georgia being in the military alliance would be something that is more beneficial geopolitically? Well, of course, um, we don't need to officially um, accept these countries as NATO members. As uh, we know, every NATO country must vote for that, and we have such uh, NATO members as Hungary or Turkey, which are not that much willing of uh, voting uh, in accord with the others. But we can provide bilateral military support, like nobody uh, or nothing prevents um, German troops or Polish troops or, I don't know, Finnish troops right now to just um, send one battalion, uh, one battle group to, to, to Georgia or to Ukraine, not obviously to the front line, but in case of Ukraine, there are interesting um, suggestions to station NATO troops, uh, not sent as NATO troops, but sent as countries' troops along the uh, Ukrainian-Belarusian border, where are like no fighting, just like as a sign that uh, we will not tolerate a future attack from Belarus, for example. But that would provide the Ukrainians with a lot of um, room for maneuver uh, for sending their troops to uh, from the Belarus border to the east, and that will demonstrate the support. The same we can do you know, with, with Georgia. So we don't need to 
to send NATO troops or to Ukraine or Georgia being a NATO member um, to, to send our troops uh, on, on the ground. Uh, like we know France does it all the time with many countries. Uh, we also have like uh, similar uh, cases with other countries. Um, and it's absolutely normal. Like we have our troops in Kosovo, we have our troops, uh, like uh, we had them in Afghanistan, is of course quite another example, uh, but uh, a very sad one. But um, thinking about that, uh, nobody questioned uh, the logic of sending our troops to support a government, uh, which was not even supported by the majority of the Afghans. Uh, and compare it to the case when we have a functioning state, democratic state Georgia, democratic state Ukraine, with functioning political system, parliament, media, rule of law. Why not to send our troops there to just demonstrate solidarity? All right. So last but not least, like you mentioned, we do see a little bit of geopolitical tug of war in terms of Georgia being either leaning towards Russia or being able to bring into the fold of the West. And you also did uh, bring up some very uh, precise measures that could be taken. How open do you think the West would be to taking these steps, or do you think they might just keep them on a back burner? Well, I'm afraid that the um, the largest, the biggest problem which we have in the West is that we believe that what we have now, we may not act too harsh in order not to make things worse. Mm -hmm. And that is the logic which we used to have in 1970s when both blocks, the Eastern Bloc, the Western Bloc, they were ready for a fight and they were pretty strong. And we didn't want to, to spark, to, like, to send a spark to ignite the situation, to, to lead the situation to world war. But now we are already in war. And in this case, when one party, and I mean Russia, but also with uh, Russia's allies like Iran or North Korea or China, when they push us into the war and when they use our weakness to expand and to get more resources, to get more power, also more image power within other countries like in Africa, Southeast Asia, South America, we may not stick to the patterns of 1970s where the world was more or less divided between two blocks. And we may not say, okay, we, we, we may not think out of the box. We may not uh, demonstrate decisiveness. We may not scare or angry and make our opponent angry because Putin will react somehow. Putin already reacts. Putin acts. That is, that is uh, worse than reacting. He acts, he forces us to either accept his actions or to react. And our reactions are too slow and too weak. And that is the yeah. problem. Because if we had said, we don't only name the red lines, we effectively impose them, we effectively, uh, we effectively draw them with our troops on the ground, with our weapons on the ground, with harsh sanctions. Mm -hmm. That would be a quite different situation. But for mm -hmm. that, we need quite different way of thinking of our leadership. Definitely. Thank you so much for your input and insight. Really appreciate it. And thanks again for being with us on Eastern Express. Thank you so much. And now we're moving on to the Eastern News Flash, a series of all the latest stories from the East that you don't want to miss. The Russian government has nationalized 15 defense companies as part of its efforts to increase control over military production following the invasion of Ukraine. Nationalization is a response to what officials describe as unlawful privatization and, in some instances, a foreign control of these assets. Valued at $3.6 billion, 15 defense companies are now in the hands of the Russian government. This move comes in the wake of Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine, prompting authorities to nationalize key assets to ensure greater control over the defense industry. President Vladimir Putin and other officials have defended these measures, saying that Russia is not undergoing a process of deprivatization or nationalization of its economy. The spotlight has fallen on the Shebyabinsk electrometallurgical plant seized in February, with its former billionaire owner Yuri Antipov arrested on charges of fraud. State prosecutors allege that Antipov and his wife transferred assets to countries hostile to Russia, thereby jeopardizing national defense and security interests. 
In contrast, Antipov's defense team denies any link between the plant's products and the military industrial sector, maintaining that they supply metallurgical plants for civilian use. The Latvia Ministry of Foreign Affairs has declared a Russian diplomat persona non grata, citing a series of provocations and unacceptable communications that contravene the 1961 Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations. The diplomat has been ordered to leave the country by April 10th. The charge d'affaires at the Russian embassy, Oleg Zikov, has faced strong protests from the Latvian authorities. The Latvian side has expressed their disapproval over the Russian embassy's continued pattern of misleading public statements that allegedly discredit Latvian public institutions and incite societal discord. Despite previous warnings, the Russian embassy is accused of persisting in its contentious rhetoric. As a result, the Latvian foreign minister has made the decision to expel a Russian diplomat who is now required to leave Latvia by the end of April 10th. This move is yet another example of the growing strain between Latvia and Russia as Latvia takes a firm stand against what it perceives as a breach of diplomatic protocol and an attempt to undermine its state sovereignty and social harmony. The Czech Security Information Service has uncovered a Moscow-funded network accused of disseminating Russian propaganda throughout Europe, including attempts to influence the European Parliament. Prime Minister Petr Fiala has announced that the network operating through the Prague-based news outlet Voice of Europe has been actively working to dissuade the European Union from supporting Ukraine amidst the ongoing Russian invasion. The Czech Security Information Service has identified that the network called Voice of Europe is financed by Russia and has been functioning within Czech borders. According to Czech Prime Minister Petra Fila, the findings indicate that the network's activities pose a significant threat to the security of both the Czech Republic and the European Union. The group's efforts were directed against Ukraine's territorial integrity, sovereignty and independence, with their influence extending even into the European Parliament. Despite sanctions imposed by Czech authorities on individuals involved in the network, the Voice of Europe continues its publication. The Czech Republic, a staunch EU and NATO member, has been a significant provider of military and humanitarian assistance to Ukraine since the onset of the Russian invasion, standing firm against efforts to undermine its support. And that's all for this episode of Eastern Express. But for more news, update and commentary, please stay tuned to TVP World. <laughs>